You're going to see a lot of different varieties, a lot of different sort of concepts of how to do it. And I think we're all at the point of trying to say, what can we do? What do we need to do? And how do we keep on innovating with, uh, with achieving the benefits of the endoscope with fusion? Because there's a lot, we talked about how infections are basically eliminated with constant irrigation. There's no wound, there's no air in the wound. There's constant irrigation, we have benefits. We have quicker recoveries because we have less tissue resection. There's less bleeding, et cetera, et cetera. So we know there's a lot of benefits. And I would debate that the recovery curves excuse me, the benefit curves of endoscopic applies even more to our fusion patients if we can do it right and we can do it in a safe way. And obviously, this is where it starts, is that it's a tale of woe, right? This is me starting out with an endoscopic fusion. I had a, a patient like this, L5-S1, grade two sp spondylolisthesis, and I thought I had a great case. This is what I, the first, this is my intraoperative at the end of the case. I got a good reduction of the spondylolisthesis, good height restoration. I apologize, it doesn't protect very well. And then this, the day after, I have a great view. Good reduction, right? I really should be happy. I'm you know, fist pumping how good this, this outcome is. My patient looks great. And then six weeks, she's collapsed. She's subsided into it. It's not looking great. She's doing okay. I'm all right. I'm not happy with the way the x-rays look. And then she comes back about a year later. And this is what you see. It's completely collapsed around it. Now if she's fused into this cage, you can see that there's a, there's a lot of bone growing into the cage. But she's had a recurrence of her radiculopathy and she's had screw fractures. This is a problem. It's really frustrating. So I just gave this talk in, um, in Scotland, and of course you have to use William Wallace when you're giving that talk. And so I was like, okay, now I'm gonna give this talk in Seattle. So I was gonna, I would quickly look for like, you know, uh, images of uh, Seattle screams, and this is what came up. <laughs> this guy, and I was like, okay, it looks like Nirvana maybe on mushrooms. And it's just because that's his name, he's Scream. And so then the next thing, it was like, oh, okay, what's, you know, like I'll, I'll scroll down Google, what's the next image of the Scream? And it's these ladies, I'm like, okay, now that's classic Seattle. And apparently this is a tradition. You gotta, you gotta do this, I don't know what date it is, but you're there. But I think was the most, was that this is the top Google link for Seattle Scream, was this hair salon. So just, I would say that this is what we do in Utah when we're frustrated and screaming. And this is, I was gonna say, this is a nod to all the Austrians in the group. This is the Herminator who's, who came off of the, uh, the ski slope in uh, Nagano. Anyways, so the, the point of being frustrated is that oftentimes when you're using the trans and transframinal approach, you have to use a smaller cage and that does create higher risk. Because footprint really does matter, especially when you're using higher forces. When you're trying to create the, you know, correct a spondylolisthesis, when you're trying to restore height, you have problems and oftentimes that location of the cage matters and getting onto the, op the anterior apophyseal ring. So um, when there's a problem, you've got to find a better way. And so this is what I've been doing more recently. Uh, another case, uh, dynamic grade one, two spondylolisthesis, uh, pretty substantial slip. And this is her MRI, pretty stenotic. So what she really needs is a full decompression. So my indications, this is mobile, severe stenosis. This is her problem. And so I know that this is not just a tall disc that needs to be fused. This is, this is truly pathoanatomy, and we have to do an adequate decompression. So my goals for the surgery is gonna be inner laminar decompression, get both lateral recesses and correct the spondylolisthesis, and I wanna reestablish foraminal height. And I also wanna keep lordosis, right? Because if you look back on those x-rays, when you see these patients that are dynamic, they often have a, f a substantial loss of their lordosis, and we wanna restore that. And I don't think that my prior endoscopic transferaminal would be sufficient. And oftentimes the difficulty here is that, you know, as uh, Shen Shen was going over, if you're going transferaminal, oftentimes that root really narrows that corridor. But when you're going through a traditional T-lift corridor, you've got a big corridor to go through. And so what we'll do in this case, we're gonna resect around just like we would do with the decompression, remove the ipsilateral IAP, remove the uh, majority of the contralateral IAP, disconnect, and then remove the top of the SAP ipsilaterally. So we can have a really dynamic decompression and we can really restore lordosis by being able to res resect the majority of the facets. So we remove all that ligament, right? We're gonna move big chunks so that way we can, again, we can restore height without being limited by the, the dorsal structures. What I'll do there is I'll use a uh, stenosis scope over the facet, but I'll be able to still reach to the contralateral side. 
And so this is what the operative video looks a little bit like. You see that right here, I'm just gonna clear off the joint capsule, be able to visualize the caudal aspect of my IEP, really be able to remove it, and then I'm gonna start to drill on the medial aspect of the facet, and I'm gonna take that down, and I'm gonna start working it across. So I'm making basically a horizontal cut across the, the facet so that I can be able to resect the caudal aspect of the IAP. And what you'll see here is as you get there, I'm gonna to start to, there's the, um, the medial wall by the, uh, the dura and, and the ligamentum flavum. And here, I'm just gonna, once I'm finally through it, I'm just gonna take the, the drill and I'm gonna crack it off, and then I'm gonna take out that piece of the, the IAP. I used to, um, just like uh, Sanjay was saying, I would use a, I'd take out a huge chunk of bone and I'd be really stuck. You couldn't pull it out, you couldn't fish it out. And so now I do a smaller chunk of bone and then I just drill up the pars and really resect the pars cranially so I give myself a really nice window to look at it. And so then now I'm gonna turn and I'm gonna start to drill out the SAP. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna take out the lateral wall of the SAP and once I've got the SAP, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna down fracture it, and then I'm gonna pull it out. So now I'll be able to get the whole transframinal window. As you see right here, I'm just drilling that, the, uh, the lateral tip. And then that keeps me safe when I'm doing this maneuver because I'm keeping the, the, the wall laterally intact. So I don't have to worry about the, the, the capsular artery. And now I've got ligamentum flavum basically from pars to pedicle and I can start to remove that and then visualize the disc space over it, right? Just carefully sculpting out that ligamentum flavum. And then you'll start to see uh, the medial aspect of the, uh, the nerve root, um, the uh, traversing nerve root right there, right? So this is the Kamen's triangle. I'll be able to visualize up. There's, it's a collapsed disc space, right? So Kamen's triangle is small. And so now I can start to uh, work on mobilizing the nerve root start to do my discectomy. Oftentimes at this point, I'll start to then work on my, um, either I'll do a little discectomy or start to work on my contralateral side. And that's right here, I'm just doing a little prep of the discectomy so that I can enter in with, uh, with other tools. So here's the contralateral side, I'll just swing across, resect my contralateral ligamentum flavum, get good de, you know, debulking of the contralateral lateral recess. And so then I'll just sweep the nerve root a little bit away and now I can be aggressive with the discectomy. And so at this point, now that I know where my discectomy is, I can see the bottom, excuse me, the, the superior aspect of L5 in this case right there. I'm gonna put a, a wire into there and I'm gonna impact it until I can feel the anterior annulus. You can see it kind of stops. And then I'll switch over and I'll do the rest of the, uh, the discectomy under uh, fluoroscopic imaging. And then I'll come back, look at, inspect my discectomy, make sure I've got a, a good end plates, and then I'll pack in a huge gauge, right? I have good window to be able to put in a large expandable cage. Usually I'm using, it's a uh, 10 and a half wide and it's 31 or 36 uh, wide and then I'll, I'll do my distraction. So some of the key steps were really getting that in this spondylolisthesis, make sure that you resect that, that pars high enough because you don't want to waste time, you don't want to be over resecting the pars but at the same time you, you've got to give yourself a visualization and being able to reach across to the contralateral SAP is particularly important. So this is what she looked like before on the left. That's a six week imaging. You can see that she's really not as, as substantially collapsed uh, at that time. And you can see this is how much of the facet really resecting on the bone windows there. So this is her immediate post-op results. Sorry, no spine healthy, I apologize, Christoph. She's the one, she's like, this is, she was sent home the same day with no left leg pain. And this six weeks out, she's saying like, you know, what you would like to hear from your patients. And this is my, see the 100% improvement? This is my uh, lingo with I have my nurse practitioner. My nurse practitioner is gonna see these patients back. And a critical aspect for me is what their re relative degree of improvement is. Because if I have a patient that we've done an endoscopic procedure and there's less than 75% improvement, that's a problem. That's when I say like, we either got the wrong level, we got the wrong diagnosis, something's not right. More oftentimes reporting, you know, repeating an MRI at that time is if they're not at, you know, uh, with a high degree of improvement in patient satisfaction. 
So um, caveats of this technique is right. I've only done it probably about 20 times. We really do need to establish fusion status with all these patients, really establish the durability, and compare it to the MIS and open techniques, because I do believe that there's a better risk reduction with, uh, with this surgery, and there may be even better advancements when we consider biportal techniques. And with that, I want to thank you. Hey, Mark, I, I had a question. On your, after you do your endoscopic debridement and discectomy and stuff, then you got to obviously place the screws, right? Yeah. Do you just extend that incision, same incision, or do you do a separate incision on that side? It really depends on what, how big the patient is. So uh, some, most of the time I'm trying to use the same skin incision, but sometimes you, if it's a really large patient, I know that my, my trajectory for my screws and my trajectory for my, my cage are different. Perfect. That was a great talk, Mark. Um, in the interest of time, we'll have to um, move on uh, to our next speaker.